Excelsior, true believers! You are about to embark upon a journey, a trip to the 70s and 80s, when mighty Marvel Comics ruled over all. The Defenders, Doctor Strange, the Champions, Deathlock, the Submariner, the Incredible Hulk, Kill Raven, the Son of Satan, the Macabre Man Thing, and all your other Bronze Age favorites every week appearing on Defenders Dialogue. Now, here are your guides, Christopher Golden and Brian Keane. Excelsior, true believers. Excelsior indeed, Chris Golden. Welcome back, folks, once again to another episode of the Defenders Dialogue here on the Brian Keene Radio Network. Chris, I'm excited. Can you tell? <laughs> I, well, I can always tell when you're excited, but especially when we're video chatting instead of just audio chatting, I can see the excitement on your face. I love these issues of Adventure into Fear. Today we're doing issues 13 through 15. You know, uh, we're we're recording this, of course, uh, many days before our listeners will hear it. But yesterday on Twitter, uh, Jimmy Palmiotti asked people, you know, what they were doing to cope with the the utter existential dread that is 2020. Yeah. And and I told him, I, I said, it's it's reading these Bronze Age comics and then talking with you about them every week. Um, that is what's getting me through. It's what brings me peace. It's what brings me joy. And the the fond nostalgia I got from Adventure into Fear 13. I remember buying this at a yard sale uh, in the 70s, you know, for a quarter, which I think was five cents more than the cover price, and reading it and just being blown away uh, by it. And and to reread it as an adult, I, I, I still found much love in it, so... Can't wait to yeah, talk yeah. about this. It's it's really interesting. Also, by the way, Jimmy's an old friend. Jimmy, I've been I've known Jimmy for decades at this point, and uh, and I don't know that I know anybody who loves comics as a as a business and as an art form more than Jimmy. Um, he's he's an amazing guy, um, just like a true uh, stand up individual, and. Uh, but I'm sure he'd love to wax poetic um, about this stuff with us. Yeah, um, I want to. I want to point out a couple of things here. Just observations. The first is reading these. It made me so sad that it, 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 I mean, it's sad, obviously, that Steve Gerber passed away so young. Um, but reading them, it made me so sad that he's not alive for us to talk to about them. Yeah, because. Again, like, and this my my second point is, a, a few years ago, you know, I, I I'm a huge movie like fanatic, as right. you, and in fact, I died. I I I've got this app now where I can track, you know, which movies I've seen, and I'm going through some years, and I'm just like, I've basically seen everything. So when I come across a movie that's, when I come across a movie that's great, that. I'd never seen. I'm always like, oh, what a what a relief! And my son Daniel, almost like every night now in, during the uh, coronavirus, are searching through all the various uh, streaming platforms to try to find something that we can watch that's actually really good. Right. Although Dan loves shitty science fiction and horror movies, but a few years ago, I stumbled upon a uh, not stumbled upon. I decided to watch a movie that I had been for whatever reason avoiding for decades which is I had never seen the Tom Cruise, Leah Thompson film, all the right moves, <laughs> which is from our youth. I mean, right. it's like prime time, our high school days. And, and some, I think because he plays a jock in the movie and the, and, and the, the cover of the VHS tape when I worked at, at video plus in Framingham, Massachusetts was too jockey. And I was just like, ah, screw that. Like, I'm just not interested in that. But for whatever reason, I had just had been disinterested in it, like willfully, purposefully avoiding it. And I watched it and I felt transported back to the age I was when the movie came out and thought, I'm actually really glad that I missed this for so long. Because for that brief shining moment, I was able to reenter my life at that age and be like, wow, 
this is what it felt like to to experience these movies for the first time, these experiences that we sort of shared culturally, pop culturally in that era. Right. I'm feeling right now exactly the same way about reading these man thing stories because I have willfully, purposefully decided decades ago that I was not interested in these, that I I wasn't I didn't like them, that they were boring. That they were, I don't know why. I mean, I'd read a couple of issues and and they just didn't spark to me. But I think it was also just because like, well, he's a big shambling lump of whatever. And it's not going to be compelling to me. And and it's just like when I watched All the Right Moves. I read these three issues that we're going to cover today. And I'm just like, this stuff is so great. Yep. And there's, you know, issue 15, there are some things I don't like about it. But it is laying the groundwork for a lot of stuff that's to come as well. Oh, yes. Um, so I'm really glad that we're doing these. I'm having such a good time. And it's and it's not the same as when we did The Defenders or anything else that I had previous a previous relationship to. Right. You know, it's like, uh, anyway, so it's great. Oh, no, I, I get it. That's how it was for me when we went through The Champions. Uh, listeners will recall, I I had missed those as a kid. So they were new to me. Uh, and you're, you're absolutely right. It transports you back to the era when you discovered this stuff, you know, not just the comics themselves, but everything in them, the Marvel value stamps, the letters pages, the bullpen bulletins, the ads, you know? So I had that Mego Spider-Man back in the day. <laughs> yeah. I think we've talked about that before. My favorite of the Mego Mego figures, whatever they were, uh, was the Falcon. Yeah. And and I and I don't know why, because, again, they had these little uh, uh, the costumes were made of some kind of strange cloth. Yes. The fabric was really weird and stretchy. Um, and I, for some reason, I liked the Falcon because his boots came off. <laughs> um, and for some reason, like, but the problem is that on the Iron Man figure or the Falcon figure or whatever or Captain America. I always lost at least one of the boots. Yeah. And if you lost one of the boots, you had to get rid of the other boot eventually because yep. then it's I, stupid for him to go around with one boot. I lost one of Conan's, but I, ha I had the Conan one uh, <laughs> and I lost one of his boots and he looks stupid with one boot on. I remember taking the other one off. <laughs> That's why Spider-Man made more sense because he had no boots. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's get into it. <clears throat> we start with... Uh, Adventure into Fear, issue 13. Now, a reminder to listeners, Adventure into Fear was an anthology series. Uh, Man-Thing was the main story, and then they always do a couple reprints in the back. We are not covering those reprints, which are from Silver Age and Golden Age horror comics. Uh, we're only focusing on the Man-Thing stories. Um, so this issue is titled Where Worlds Collide. Of course, the great Steve Gerber. Uh, doing the writing and Val Merrick on uh, art with Frank Boll on inks. Uh, 1972, this issue came out where worlds collide. And and again, the art is fantastic. Val Merrick's art on these is fantastic. Um, I also want to say, I blame you because uh, last night reading these issues, I went online and I ordered something I thought I would never ever read. I ordered volume one of the complete collection of Howard the Duck. There you go. I'm proud of you. And I'm just like, and it hurt me to do it, but I did it anyway. I uh, I am rereading Howard the Duck uh, on my own, just, just for my own enjoyment. I, I figure we probably never get around to him on this show, although we may. Um, and And boy... They still hold up. I I almost want to cover them just because for the for the uh, comics have never been political crowd. Yeah, it, it'll shut them the fuck up once and for all. Because <laughs> Howard the Duck was nothing but politics and social commentary. I look forward to it. I don't think I was sophisticated enough to. Uh, you were clearly sophisticated enough to appreciate it when we were teens, but or younger, but uh, but not I, sir. Um, I, you know, I wasn't though. I, I have to credit uh, a teacher of mine, Mr. Shu. Um, he was the one that introduced me to Hunter S. Thompson. He was the one that introduced me to the music of Led Zeppelin. Uh, but he was also the one. This was Mr. Shu, like Mr. the guy Shue. from Glee. 
Yeah. No, well, is that a character from Glee? That was the teacher on Glee, yeah. Well, Mr. Shu now was my... You, picturing you learning to sing. Uh, Mr. Shu <laughs> was, in fact, my, my English and drama club teacher. Uh, yeah. He knew I couldn't sing, though. He'd put me in the musical, and, and I would William Shatner my line. You know, my, the lines I was supposed to sing. Uh, Annie, get your gun. I would get up and say, there's no business. Like, show business. But we're getting off on a tangent. Anyway... Mr. Shu, you know, I, I'm reading Howard the Duck in class, and, uh, you know, he takes it from me. I think he's going to, you know, not give it back. But after after class is over and he gives me the comic back, he explains the social subtext that was completely going over my head. I thought it was cool because Kiss was in the comic book. He was explaining <laughs> all everything that Gerber was commenting on. Uh, so I have to credit him for that. Uh, listen, we're nothing but tangents today, but. Uh, first of all, before I forget, I I'm waiting for the Morbius omnibus to arrive, but I do think, and I have all the comics, I do think that when the Morbius film is approaching, uh, we should do Morbius on this show. Agreed. Because we're doing Adventure to Fear Man thing, we should do Adventure to Fear with Morbius. But in addition, um, uh, oh, and shit, now I've lost my train of thought. Something about Mr. Shu, and, uh, well, it'll come back to me. You you want video footage of me in the the high school musical back in the well, day? Well, that too. I actually have video of me uh, as Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof. In high, I've school. got I've got video VHS of me as Von Helsing in Dracula, but that wasn't a musical. So. <laughs> okay. All right, so yeah, I uh, venture into fear issue thirteen. We open with a strange and we we suspect maybe sinister but we're just not sure cult and uh they have an altar and their leader is this old man and in the the green flames coming from an urn on the altar we see the man thing and and he tells them see him revealed before you he alone among all the creatures of the earth stands with us at the dreaded point where worlds collide and the caption box tells us that that the man thing himself is humankind's last hope for survival. And I love that. Uh, and we can sort of summarize part of this, but I love that Gerber has taken such a tangent. I think it's appropriate that we're tangenting so much today because he basically took this thing that was basically Swamp Thing at the very beginning and has spun it out into something pure Gerber. I mean, yep. it's, it's going off into his own sort of lunatic direction, which I love. Yep. And uh, you're right. We can summarize it. Basically the swamp in the Florida Everglades that the man thing inhabits as any longtime Marvel fan knows is a nexus of realities. It is a, an interdimensional crossroads where all realities meet. And this is the first introduction of that into the Marvel universe. And, and the man thing is the guardian of that nexus. Right. Well, we, and we'll be established as the guardian of that nexus. The other thing that we should, again, let's just get it out of the way. Yeah. So basically, and we're going to get into what this is, but uh, this cult, and they are referred to as a cult, which is led by their high priest is the grandfather of Jennifer Kale and her brother, Andy. That's right. Uh, his name is Joshua Kale. And uh, they're looking for a book. Uh, he believes that they have this book that they need for a ritual that they're about to perform. That's right. Uh, it's the Tome of Zeridna. Zeridna was a an Atlantean priestess who existed long before our favorite Prince Namor, uh, right. the Submariner, was even born. Yeah. Uh, so, so the and that we'll, and we're going to get to her because it's all connected now. Um, but the Tome of Zeridna. Uh, was supposed to be in this box, but the box is empty. And we're led to believe that this is the book that Jennifer stole in the previous issues to perform a ritual that went awry and allowed the, the demon, what's his name, Thog? Thog. Thog to, the Nether Spawn. Right. To, in, to enter our, uh, you should have named your son that, to enter, uh, <laughs> to enter our world. Um, and we're led to believe that was the book which Jennifer has burnt it no longer exists, and that's what we're we're led to believe. But clearly, Joshua Kale is very worried about the absence of this. 
And he's not the only one that's worried. Uh, we transitioned to Jennifer and Andy at uh, at the soda shop because I guess those still existed in 1972. And they're with Jennifer's boyfriend. Um, his name is Jackson, just like the giant green rabbit in Marvel's Star Wars comics. And uh, she's telling Jackson everything that, that you just summarized. And Jackson does not believe her. Right. He doesn't believe even the man thing. He doesn't believe in anything. He says... I go down to the edge of that swamp all the time to play my guitar and brood and be alone. I mean, he really is a character from Riverdale or something. Um, and, uh, and I've never seen anything like it. Right. Uh, and so, and, and Andy is worried. He's telling them, telling uh, Jackson, you've got to keep away just because we burned the book that called the demon. Doesn't mean he can't come back. That's right. Uh, yeah. So Today. at least one of the other cultists, thinks that Joshua actually stole the book, you know, and Joshua says, Hey, that's absurd. And the cultist tells him, is it? We'll just see. Uh, and you know, Joshua, his spidey sense is tingling about this, this challenger to his rule. Uh, but meanwhile, Jackson, as he told Jennifer, he does, he goes down to the edge of the swamp and he's playing his guitar, enjoying some solitude and peace. When suddenly a demon emerges from the swamp, falls upon him, uh, and begins to attack him. And the man-thing shambles up upon the scene and, and witnesses this. The demon turns to dust. It dissolves, pours itself over Jackson's body, clings to him like spider webs, and then slowly, agonizingly, worms its way into his flesh. Yeah, this is great. I mean, this yeah. is not only not only points to Valmeric for the, the demon, which is really cool looking. It's not like, you know, the typical demon appearance. It's very cool. But um, what happens to Jackson here is right out of any of the horror movies that would come out right now. Like, you know, uh, the, the fact that it pours itself over him and, and it, you know, it's, it's a body horror moment uh, that I love. I was like, this is really cool. Um, then it gets fucking weird, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> that's right it does he goes shambling off uh and we we go back to you know jennifer and andy and their and their grandpa and you know uh he's telling them you know they did the right thing by burning the book but it was the wrong book uh what they burned was not the tome of zaradna because the tome of zaradna cannot be used for evil exactly um, so so someone swapped out the tome of zaradna so somehow or or it was never that that they'd gotten the wrong book uh so they're still searching for the tome of zaradna and uh jennifer says grandpa if if you really are a sorcerer and the swamp is haunted jackson's out there right now that's right um, so how she knows that i don't know it's her 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 spidey sense for brooding dudes uh, <laughs> is tingling. So, uh, they, so they, uh, you, you know, I got to tell you, over time, Jennifer Kale, when it comes to the the mystical members of the Marvel Universe, of course, Son of Satan is always going to be my number one. But Jennifer Kale and another character who we'll meet later uh, in this episode, DeKim, they, they are some of my favorites. And to go back and revisit jennifer here when she's still just a teenager and she's unsure of herself and and to watch her develop uh rereading this as an adult it, 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 it's a real treat because gerber really gave her some agency you know um, oh yeah oh yeah she's, so yeah they, also reminds me very much of sabrina too very much so yeah it, it, at this point yeah so they go driving off into the swamp and they come across jackson but he looks strange, uh, and he acts strange because he waves his hand, reality bends, and a giant dimensional hole opens up, and the car, unable to stop, plunges through, and Jackson follows it, and the man thing, dimly recognizing you know Jennifer and Andy and, and realizing that he must protect them, he goes plunging through the hole as well. Um and then we show the, the car, which looks like, I don't know, like a Bentley or a Phaeton or something. I don't know. It's like floating, 
floating in some kind of weird interdimensional limbo, uh, which reminded me in very unfortunate ways of uh, the DC character who drives his cab through space. He's friends with Alan Scott. I don't remember that one at all. I don't, you know, I've only read, you know, but I, whatever it is, I was like, oh, no, that I don't like that. But anyway, <laughs> um, but then we have a really cool turn of events, a, a, a sad moment here. Yeah. And the return of Ted Salas. Yeah. Reality shifts again. And uh, the man thing finds himself in basically this this dimension of mirrors. Uh, and all of the mirrors are showing his reflection except one that mirror shows Ted Salas's reflection. And when the man thing reaches out and touches it, the impossible occurs. Yeah. Uh, so Ted Salas swaps places with the man thing. And now uh, Ted Salas is with us and all the mirrors, but one show his reflection, but one shows the man thing. And he could, the last thing he remembers was the car accident in the swamp. And then he is, uh, he's confronted by our old friend Thog, whom he recognizes but doesn't know why. That's right. Uh, Thog then summons what appears to be Ellen, Ted Salas's uh, partner. Um, betrayer, betrayer, betrayer. And yes. Um, and and she appears, and uh, you know, she tells him that his human form is his to keep, if. He will kill the humans who 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 also came through, meaning the, the kales. And, you know, Ted Salas says, you must be joking. I'm getting out of here. And he, and he takes off. Well, and he makes a choice, Brian. He goes back to those mirrors and knowing what the stakes are here and knowing that uh, what they need is the man thing. He yep. willingly goes back and trades places again with the man thing, submerging his consciousness uh, Ellen is upset. She runs over uh, what appears to be Ellen, but the man thing grabs her and her, her leg snaps off like glass and then she fades to nothing. Yes. It's a really cool sequence illustrated here by Val Merrick. Um, and Thog. Terribly, I've got to, I've got to continue. I'm sorry. Which okay. leads momentarily to the best part of the issue, which <laughs> is Thog attacks the man thing with some kind of, you know, bolt of hellfire and the man thing responds with the only weapons available to him. He starts <laughs> picking up all of the minor demons around him and using them and hurling them at Thog as his weapons. He's fastball specialing all these little screaming demons at, at, at their boss. <laughs> he is. And, and the dialogue here, you know, Thog says, hurl my own demons at me, will you? <laughs> then I shall throw all the might of my own form at you. And he he leaps through the air and dives into the man thing, just like the vision, you know, uh, yep. merging through something. And, and when he does this, the man thing bursts into flame, bursts into hellfire. Well, then, uh, you know, quickly we'll we'll cover the fact that What's really going on here, which Joshua Kale figures out, Joshua Kale, who looks younger here, all of a sudden, Grandpa looks more like Stan Lee than 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 an elderly man. But uh, <laughs> Joshua realizes that the whole thing is an illusion. It's a vast psychic mirage caused by the demon inhabiting Jackson. And they now realize it and they should snap back to reality. But the man thing doesn't know that they are in a, an illusion. He doesn't know that this is not reality. And they're trying to figure out how can they make him realize this, Brian? Right. Um, and, and they do, uh, you know, he, Jackson grabs a hold of Jennifer uh, and, you know, says you must die. And, and the man thing is having none of that. He likes Jennifer. So he grabs a hold of Jackson, brutally takes hold of his arm, throws to the boy to the ground and, uh, the captions tell us the man thing is waiting for for fear, for him to know fear, because, you know, whatever knows fear, of course, burns at his touch. Uh, but when he grabs Jackson and sees the fear, the boy doesn't burn. How can that be? Unless, unless, unless what, Chris? 
unless it isn't real. And the moment the man thing realizes that what's around them is an illusion, they snap back to reality. He's holding on to Jackson and Jackson starts to burn, but it isn't Jackson burning at the man thing's touch. It's the demon inhabiting him, which is driven out and destroyed and becomes his ectoplasmic form just becomes a pile of ashes. Jackson lives. Uh, and then we realize, or I should say that, uh, Joshua Kale realizes that Jennifer's connection to the man thing means that not only is the man thing a creature of destiny, Jennifer herself also is. That's right. Which leads us to Adventure to Fear 14, Gerber Merrick with Chick Stone on inks. Yep. Uh, and this issue is called The Demon Plague. Uh, we see the man thing fighting his arch nemesis, Hank the Alligator. <laughs> and I can't remember, Chris. We came up with the name last week, but what what did we decide to name the snake? Um, I don't remember what, what we named the snake. Might be Dave. Dave. Okay, so we we we, we had Dave the snake, Hank the alligator. If you're a new listener and wondering what we're talking about, throughout the Man Thing comics, uh, one of the tropes is you, you always see him fighting an alligator, and and Chris and I decided that it would. In our continuity, it's going to be the same alligator every time. And that alligator is named after author and editor Hank Wagner, who listens to the show. Exactly. (laughs) So Hank the Alligator, we open uh, Adventure to Fear 14 with Hank the Alligator attacking. Uh, And but he's not just fighting Hank here. He's fighting several alligators, a bunch of vultures. What are they doing there? Uh, And and a whole fistful of snakes. So yeah. uh, I don't know what's going on there, but it's a great splash page that uh, that leads into. Oh, I I know what's going on. Bro. Well, yeah, seemingly the the animals in the swamp and the nexus of realities have been driven insane. Right. But it's not just there because a thousand miles away in St. Louis, uh, some some kids are playing. They're you know, they're playing cowboys, and uh, one of them actually attacks his friend and, and like legitimately tries to kill him. Same thing his happens. In an office. Whips his buddy in the face. <laughs> yeah. You know, same thing happens as at an office in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, there's a, an administrative assistant and she's taking dictation. Her name is Miss Kelman. She's taking dictation from her boss. And uh, Miss Kelman does what Chris? Uh, Miss Kelman kicks him in the face and, and uh, and I feel like this is like a 1972 Me Too moment. Miss <laughs> uh, Miss Kelman kicks her boss in the face, and he's a dick. So even though she's gone insane, he does have it coming. Yep. And in, in uh, another in another sequence that again could be mirroring the times we live in right now in Detroit, Michigan, a mild mannered salesman who's driving down the highway. Uh, suddenly turns his vehicle into a weapon of mass destruction and tries to run over pedestrians. Yeah. So what's happened here is that because in the last issue, our heroes were unable to recover the tome of Zered Na and the demons have come into this world there, uh, which they need the tome in order to, to send the demons packing Uh that demons have driven basically the entire planet insane, except for the people in the town where the Kales live right by the nexus of all realities. Their proximity to the nexus is keeping them from going crazy. Right. So we have a moment where, uh, where man thing is whip is, has hanked the alligator by the tail and is spinning him around in circles and hurls him off, uh, across the swamp, uh, in a moment worthy of King Kong. Uh, but, then Hank's less fortunate cousin sneaks up on Man Thing Brian, <laughs> and knows fear, and of course is burned to ash. But I, I love this moment. The alligator attempts to take Man Thing by surprise and <laughs> leaps at him from behind, because alligators are known for being able to leap and get three feet off the ground in their leaping skills. Uh, and basically, because the Man Thing is made of ooze. He passes through the man thing, like his head goes all the way through man thing, uh, and he's afraid. And so he burns. 
Yeah, basically the man thing is impaled by a living alligator and and the alligator burns inside of the man thing. So we transition to the Kale household. They're watching the news coverage and there you know there's there's more reports of just insanity all over the globe. And uh you know Joshua explains what you just did. Uh the takeover of human minds and souls by the netherworld demons has begun and uh he decides to summon the cult. Um we should mention that the guy who's the dick in the cult is named Brainerd. I don't know why, but I want to call him by name rather That's than right. just call him the dick. Well, I he's feel now, like he's if, now Brainerd if, the dick. I feel like if you're going to name your child Brainerd, you've pretty much set them on a path to be an asshole throughout their life. <laughs> yes, I think you're right. <laughs> um, maybe that's why he's so bitter all the maybe. time. <laughs> I so know. Yeah, I they, they they do this spell, and it's supposed to unlock something called the Mists of Maylock. Okay? But they don't think that the, the ritual has worked, uh, because the Mists of Maylock don't appear. And, and Brainerd says, you know, it's not working. And and the reason why is because Kale himself stole uh, the Tome of Zeridna, and, you know, Joshua confronts him, you know, um, and while they're arguing, the mists do appear. Uh, they surround Jennifer and the man thing, and they transport them across time and space. Yes, yes. And, and I think, and I actually, think actually, you should you continue, should continue on, on, because I know, I know that you love this character. Okay, so yeah, uh, they, uh, you know, they're transported across time and space. Uh, Gerber tells us a million universes away in a time outside of time and a space without measure. And they are, they, they materialize chained up in some kind of interdimensional dungeon. Um, And they, they are confronted by a guy that looks like Merlin stepping right out of King Arthur, a, a stereotypical wizard with a long beard and a pointy hat and a purple robes. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it could be a double double. Yeah, it could be Dumbledore. Um, uh, I don't know what's going on? It's funny. To interrupt and say we've got a. I've got an echo. Okay, so do we have it now? A little bit. Hang on a second here. Yeah. All right, talk now. Um, it looks like Dumbledore. Yep. Now Better. we're fine. We're good to go. Um, okay. So yeah, now I'm just going to cut to the chase. Uh, this guy is Dekim, the Enchanter, and while Doctor Strange. Maybe Earth's Sorcerer Supreme. Dekim is the universe's Sorcerer Supreme. Ba- basically, he's another planet's version of Doctor Strange. Uh, but as we find out in the 80s, he's he's far more powerful than either Stephen Strange or the Enchanted One. Well, and I I want to I want to jump in here for a second and speak in terms of Bronze Age Marvel Comics. Uh, first of all, this was 1972. Uh, we were five that year. Yes. Um, and uh, so this is before us. But I look at to Kim and all I can think is that um, in the pages of Moon Knight, which would come later, there is the character, the, the homeless alcoholic character of Crowley. And if you look at to Kim, he's basically Crowley in wizard robes. <laughs> he, is, <laughs> he looks rough, man. He is like he is he's he's got he's uh, he's got a lot of mileage on him. That's very true. That's so very he looks true. like a he looks like a a drunken, uh, you know, uh, unwashed, um, you know, wizard. So continue. Yep. So yeah, he uh, you know, he, he tells him uh, you know, I'm to Kim the Enchanter. Uh, you're on a world called Sant S A N D T. Uh, the mists of Maylock brought you here to find the tome of Zeridna. For if that book resides on your earth, the demons cannot invade you. Um, and you know, Jennifer, quite rightly, she says, uh, you know, that, that book was stolen from my grandfather's cult. And to Kim, he by his words, he says he that he doesn't believe her. He says, you know, come child, don't play innocent with me. Uh, but it's very important to look at the expression on his face. It's almost playful. Um, so he tells him that, you know, uh they the two of them have to die, both the man thing and Jennifer. Um, you know, because their their link with each other 
makes them just as dangerous as as the demons themselves. And so uh, they're going to offer them one chance. If the man thing will fight in their arena, they'll let them live if he wins. And thus we go to the – it sounds convoluted, and it is convoluted, uh, but it's still fun. <laughs> yeah, and we can explain in the next issue. But uh, yeah, you know, to sum up, it's basically a gladiatorial ring. Uh, and to Kim uh, has arranged for Mongu the gladiator to fight the man thing. That's the right. man thing basically does nothing but dodge him. Uh, Mongu keeps trying to kill the man thing, and the man thing is infuriating him by dodging him until Mongu strikes uh, and actually gets the man thing, but all he hits is slime. Uh, and the man thing gets up. When Mongu thinks he's killed him, uh, he grabs Mongu. Uh, Mongu is afraid. And of course, because he's afraid, uh, he burns. That's right. Jennifer demands to be sent home because uh, the man thing has won. Uh, and the Kim agrees. Jennifer and the man thing reappear back in the swamp. Uh, and. The man thing sort of wanders away, but Joshua Kale says the final battle is yet to come. Now, Brian, I have a question for you before we okay. talk about before we talk about issue fifteen. My question for you is: Do you think that Steve Gerber planned what happens next with the Kim, or do you think that when he was writing fourteen, he didn't really know what the hell he was what he was getting at, and he decided as he was doing it, he was like, "Oh yeah, you know what I'm going to do." Because it feels like he kind of just was winging it. Well, I mean, we know from you. You remember uh, for new listeners, if you go back wherever you listen to this show, if you go back through our archives, we did a special episode. Uh, it was Scott Edelman's interview with Steve Gerber from when Gerber was still alive, and you know he admits in that that you know, because he was writing so many monthly comics, he would often make it up as he goes along. Uh, there's also a, a book of interviews with Gerber that I've read. And uh, he says in there, a lot of times, you know, he, he put the caption in the next issue box, you know, like next issue, Howard, the duck fights Gorko, the man frog. And that's all he knew. He had no idea to go with it. And then that would act as his writing prompt. Uh, so he, he very much, was a pantser. He didn't plot things out extensively. He didn't outline. He, he, you know, he made it up as he went along. And yeah, I, I absolutely believe that's what happened here between issues 14 and 15. Yeah, uh, it makes total sense to me. And I believe issue 15 is a full length issue, right? Uh, hang on a second. Let me open it up here. With no backup. Because I'm reading in the, in the complete collection uh, and it seems like it's longer. Yes, this is a full this is a full issue with no backup. Okay, so it's Gerber and Val Mayrick and now Frank McLaughlin on inks. So Val Mayrick has a different inker every issue. And weirdly, Brian, uh, uh, are we? Well, do you want to continue or do you want to do you want to stop? I think we can get through it. I think we can get through it. A lot of this can be summarized. Yes. So um, I just want to say about this that it's really weird because the demons inhabiting everybody. It's got uh, the U.S. military using military might on civilians in major cities, as we're seeing in Portland, Oregon right now. Uh, it has, uh, you know, uh, just White House a, lawn becoming a battlefield. Which the White House lawn is a battlefield. I mean, it's like it's in it's the whole world has gone insane. And when they're yeah. summarizing that. Um, but then back at the Kale residence, the phone rings. And and what does Andy Kale learn, Brian? The man thing has left the swamp, left the nexus of realities, and he's running amok in the town of Citrusville. And I, uh, <clears throat> I wondered if you might know the guys on this page, uh, because a, a a carload of uh, hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is driving at Man Thing and shooting at him um, uh, to protect their Second Amendment rights, um, and it's uh, it's George and Orville. <laughs> these these are my neighbors. Uh, I see them all the time. They don't understand why I too 
am a supporter of the Second Amendment, and yet I, I believe that we should need licenses and things to buy our guns. <laughs> yeah, these are the guys I debate and argue with all the time. They're, they're <laughs> the ones that laugh at my Biden sign amidst their sea of Trump signs. And um, these are the guys who aren't going to wear masks. Yeah. Um, anyway, they're firing and they're, and they're firing at the man thing, but that doesn't seem to be working. So they decide to ram their car into him. You know, I got to admit, it's a good idea. But it doesn't they're not, work. They're not wearing seat belts. They're standing up in the back of the vehicle, and they decide to ram their car into the man thing. Now, unlike um, the it alligator, doesn't go well. yeah, unlike the alligator, which was able to just pass through the man thing, uh, the car hits him, and it's like hitting a boulder. Or the truck hits him, and it, it just it just it just crumples like an accordion, spilling hillbillies all across the street. <laughs> Chris, hillbilly the Kimbo. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh anyway unfortunately what happens here is the man thing drops dead and of course they the the hillbillies think that that they've killed him uh and they're dra- dragging him away with a uh, a tow truck and jennifer's going to go with them to see what happens to the body she's grieving for him they're mocking her tears of course uh because that's what such people do um and uh uh, but the reality is that it isn't that the man thing has died because uh, of anything that humans have done. Uh, it's the presence of all these demons that have been using him as their entry point into this world that's essentially poisoned him to the, the point where he has collapsed and appears to be dead. That's right. That's right. So Joshua returns to the cult and, he, you know, they're like, OK, well, what do we do now, smart guy? And he's like, I don't know. Perhaps by looking back across the mist shrouded centuries, we may get some clue. And yeah. thus he fires up a brazier, lights the incense, and they see a vision of the days of old Atlantis, Atlantis before Prince Namor. And there in the domed city above the waves lives a sorceress named Zaredna. She of the tome of Zaredna, as a matter of fact. Yeah, and 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 again, like this may be one of the things that I didn't. I think I knew this is sort of part of the story, and, and I I would have gravitated away from it. That's not right. that I would, but I, I would have I would have moved away from this because even now reading it, I was like, ugh, you know, can we just stick with the horror in the swamps? <laughs> um, but this is vital. This is vital to the story of Swamp Thing. It is. It is. But we can we can summarize a lot of it. Zared Na is a priestess um, in Atlantis. And uh, she uh, she is 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 banished to the mainland, you know, because she's a witch and and Atlantis's ruler banishes her to the mainland. So uh, she set adrift along with some followers Um, for weeks. They they float aimlessly. And in that time, she meditates, and the Atlantean gods show her the future of mankind, uh, the wars and horrors, the wonders and superheroes of eons to come. She sees everything from, you know, the Middle Ages all the way up to Captain America and Spider-Man. Eventually, they reach land, and they find a cave, and she decides that she'll make it her home, and she's going to write her book which tells of the demon plague to come. She also talks about the fact that at opposite ends of infinity, and I'm reading from her, lie two spirit worlds. One day, oh, excuse me, uh, Theria, where dwell the gods, and Salmanus, dark domain of the demons. One day long after the cataclysm wrecks Atlantis, the demons will attempt to invade our earth which is what's happening in the pages of man thing right now but there will come a savior a savior men will hate for he will bear the aspect of a monster so of course she's saying that the man thing is she's prophesying that the man thing is the savior who will save the earth from the invasion of the demons from Salmanus. that's right uh she ends up being betrayed uh the people here rise up against to call her a witch uh, and she knows her fate. Uh, she stays and meets her fate. 
her followers escape. Some of them do. Uh, but she is stabbed and dies and her body is burned. But they escape with the scrolls on which she's written all of her prophecies, which is the Tome of Zeredna. That's uh, right. But after 20,000 years, Chris, only one copy of that tome remains. And Joshua, as we transition back to, to 1972, Joshua tells us that that one lone copy is guarded by a spell to prevent even the demons from destroying it. Yeah, it's and, and of course, the only person who still remains, the last of the ancient disciples of Zared Na, immortal by her hand, she gave him immortality, is the enchanter to Kim. That's right. That's right. Uh, we transition to Jennifer. She's lying at the edge of the swamp, weeping, mourning her friend, the man thing. And to Kim appears um, and he tells her, you know, don't fear me. I'm not your enemy. Uh, you know, putting you in the arena, putting man thing in the arena was just to, to test and make sure the two of you were, were the chosen ones. Yeah. Um, don't and- fear me. Steve Gerber decided between last issue and this one that I was a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> and he tells her, he says, you know, uh, the man thing isn't dead. Uh, I did that. I made him seem so to save his life uh, because he has to trek to the farthest end of the cosmos and retrieve the actual tome of Zared Na. And Jennifer will have to help him do this. Yeah, and to do that, first, to Kim must garb you in the manner of a priestess, and with a wave of his hand, uh, suddenly, uh, you know, Florida swamp girl Jennifer Kale, uh, like a character out of Gator Bait, famous 1970s exploitation movie, is now dressed just like the sorceress Zeredna, and. You know, Brian, I have to confess, I don't love this. Okay, look, I I knew this was going to come up. Um, sure, as a 52-year-old adult male, I, I get what we're doing here. We're objectifying Jennifer's character. You know, she's she's wearing less than Red Sonya wore in Marvel Comics at the time, and that's right. saying something. Right. But and she's I, pretty I, young, I, too. Yeah, but I'll also say this. As a, you know, as a 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old kid reading these i loved jennifer kill's costume as much as i loved red sonia's costume yeah you well, grow no, no, it's, it's like, it reminds me of of valkyrie to a point as well um although valkyrie wears a lot more than jennifer but it isn't necessarily that that's the that's the issue for me i mean as, as much the issue it's just the uh, in my in my heart i'm pulling for this to remain a horror comic and this is a much more of a fantasy trope here now and i'm like eh, stay horror um which it does but it's you know but so uh, in any case and also i like i like jennifer as ordinary jennifer more than i like her when she's uh you know dressed like this you know all-powerful sorceress from uh, lost in the mists of time but in any case uh she says far out <laughs> <laughs> which is what you said in 1972 exactly uh, and she says, you know, this costume feels like it belongs to me. Yeah. Uh, but before DeKim can, you know, talk any more about that, uh, the man thing lumbers out of the, the tangle of weeds. Jennifer is, you know, very happy to see her friend alive. Um, DeKim waves his hand and transports the three of them across dimensions, across time and space. Now, I want to say two quick things. The first is that I'm really glad Gerber is Gerber wrote this rather than David Anthony Kraft, because the scene that covers the next several pages would have done five issues. If (laughs) Kraft had written it. It, Defenders tunnel world all over. Exactly. And secondly, um, I want you to cover this next bit because uh, it is very much a young Brian Keene's uh, moment here. It very much is, uh, you know, so they go traveling across time and space um, and they, they reach this burning orb outside of space and inside they come in a throne throne room and there's an altar and uh, the tome of Zared Na is on the altar. All they have to do is seize it. 
Uh, so Jennifer, I love this the sequence. Jennifer reaches out, takes the man thing by the hand, and and leads him towards the tome. Uh, but it, it's not as easy as it looks as they approach, and as Jennifer reaches for the book, this diminutive little man appears, and he starts About dancing. <laughs> maybe maybe six or seven inches high. Yeah. No, no, starts- please. But please, Brian, read his uh, read his dialogue. Oh, I've got it. He starts dancing upon the thing. And I, I want to tell listeners, this is 72. So this is before Steve Gerber gets his defenders run and creates the elf with a gun. But this this is the genesis. You see it right here. Because the little man says, I'm an elf. My name is Yop. And hell begins when my dance stops. <laughs> And it's just Gerber's. This has got to be the point while writing the script where Gerber was really high. You know, he was stoned as hell while he was writing. <laughs> but uh, uh, so basically, you know. somehow a uh, the veil is lifted from their eyes, and they see that that in fact they're not in this room that they thought they were in. They're in this horrible, hellish landscape uh, where uh, 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 Joshua Kale and Andy Kale. And a bunch of the cultists are basically crucified. Uh, and she needs to save them. And DeKim is gone. He's not there to help her save them from the dark domain. And as Jennifer watches in horror, uh, this mass of molten rock and lava begins to stir. It's it's like a, a lava version of the man thing. Except this one can speak. And it, it says, Zaridna must die. And when it says this, it's reaching for Jennifer, who you'll remember is dressed in the garb of the priestess Zeredna. Uh, but the man thing is having none of that. Um, it, 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 it he wades in, and he and the monster fight it out. The, yes, they fight it out, and Jennifer needs to help. Uh, she's trying to figure out what to do because, according to Joshua Kale, the rock creature's heat is taking the moisture from the man thing's body, which will kill him, and the man thing is weakening. Jennifer grabs the tome of Zeredna. And the moment she does and trying to read it, instead, they're transported back to the swamp the moment she has it in her hands. And now the tide has turned. That's because right. The, the, uh, the rock creature uh, doesn't have as much power in this uh, swampy environment. And the man thing is restored, much like the submariner. Uh, his power gets greater. And he smashes the, uh, the stone creature into the swamp. Uh, and as that happens, as the demon dies, the Tome of Zeredna, the MacGuffin for this entire story, disappears from Jennifer's uh, clutches. That's right. But it's not the only thing to disappear. Unfortunately, the man thing turns away from Jennifer and, and she doesn't understand why. And her grandfather explains to her that, you know, now that those forces have been put to rest, the bond between Jennifer and the man thing is broken. Um, Love, beauty, joy. These things have no place in a monster's dreary existence. And uh, the man thing shuffles off into the swamp alone. And Jennifer stands there crying, watching him go. I feel like uh, the theme from the 1970s Incredible Hulk TV series should be playing background during this <laughs> that one <laughs> all right folks so that wraps up this week's episode now i gotta tell you if you don't like politics in your comics just don't listen to us next week uh next week gerber now so far we we've had horror stories and fantasy stories uh here with uh the man thing next week we're just going to get political, and we're going to talk about the environment. We're going to talk about capitalism. Uh, it, 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 we're going to introduce some more recurring characters, recurring themes, recurring rogues gallery members. Um, I don't know if you've read ahead yet, Chris. No, I haven't. Uh, well, next week, we're going to meet uh, real estate tycoon F.A. Schist. Fascist. <laughs> <laughs> I like it who uh, is very much a 1970s version of another real estate tycoon uh, that many of you may be familiar with here in 2020. He's also a fascist. (laughs) 
Oh, my so, Lord. Well, all right, folks, well, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you did, we want to remind you um, that wherever you listen to Defenders Dialogue, uh, you can go back through the archives and listen to previous episodes. You can also listen to our sister podcast, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, Cosmic Shenanigans, Grindcast, and coming very soon, Three Guys with Beards 2.0. Oh, uh, which is what we're calling it. Chris, it used to be your podcast. You're not on it anymore. Now it's it's uh, Jim Moore, of course, from the original Three Guys of Beards. Uh, Tom Snagowski, who's no stranger to listeners of this show. And Bracken McLeod, who may be a stranger to listeners of this show. And that's okay because he is, in fact, very strange. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for information about all the, yeah, for information about all these shows, just go to BrianKeen.com, click podcasts slash radio. You can find out more about each program. You can also get advertising information there as well. Chris, that's all I have to say. Do you have anything to say? Brian, as always, the only thing I have to say is Excelsior True Believes. Excelsior indeed. See you next week, folks. Defenders Dialogue is a production of the Brian Keene Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Defenders Dialogue is written and produced by Brian Keene and Christopher Golden. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, The Horror Show with Brian Keene, Cosmic Shenanigans, and Grindcast. To advertise on Defenders Dialogue, visit BrianKeene.com and click Podcasts.